Oh man, what a morning. Just incredible to be able to be together. Um, some of us here in person, um, apparently everybody in the church that has an SUV or four-wheel drive, um, we're here and I know a whole bunch more um, watching online right now, which is great um, that we have the capacity to be together um, as a church, even on a day when it's snowy outside. But um, I just want to start our time by um, saying publicly how grateful I am for uh, John and Paul and Chris and Natalie and John and Derek and Christian in the back and Alex and Graham and John Michael and Nathan and Lindsay Kosker who are serving uh, in the lobby as the Connect team. They are the crew of people that got up this morning uh, um, and start came in um, early to be able to get everything set up, to be able to get uh, live streams um, working. I left out Will Clark. Um, sorry, Will, about that. You were um, not in the back right there. Um, but that was the crew of people that got up early and came in here and set this all up so that we could all experience Moments like what we just did with Chris and the whole crew leading us in that. And I'm mentioning all of their names, not just to sort of pass, you know, the pastoral test of like, do you actually know the names of the people on the stage? Yes, I not only know their names, like we're really good friends, but I know a lot of you know these guys. And I know a lot of you that are watching have their cell numbers in your phone. And I think it would be awesome if as a church, just throughout the day, um, they were getting texts from people that call RCC home saying, hey, thank you so much. I know it would have been uh, warmer for you and easier for you to just be at home and enjoy an extra cup of coffee. But man, you got up and you served. Um, and I just want to let you know how much I uh, appreciate that. So I would just love it if throughout the course of the day, if you're able to do that, um, if you would, just as a way of thanking and encouraging these guys, because that just feels like the kind of thing that family does, right? It's saying, thank you for what you did um, so that I could experience the transforming power of the gospel this morning. Thank you for what you did that I could experience the freedom of worship. Thank you that I could be a part of, of hearing God's word. And I'm so grateful, um, not just for them, I'm grateful for those of you that are here um, in person, but I'm really grateful for those of you that are willing to uh, tune in online today because I believe that this morning is a really crucial one for the life of our church. And even over the course of the week when it was starting to look like, oh no, there's going to be snow on Sunday, I was like, no, I don't want anything to get in the way of the message that I'm going to share today because I'm not kidding with you when I say um, this talk has literally been about three or four months in the making. Or maybe the better way to say that is I've wanted to preach today's message for about the last three or four months. In some ways, I'm going to give you the backstory of why it is that we're spending a couple of weeks in this little Old Testament book of Haggai. Um, and it really does go back about three or four months ago, kind of early to mid-fall, when for me, just one guy's story, that was probably the period of time where I felt kind of the full weight of the pandemic more than I had at any other point, right? Um, there was nothing overtly horrific going on in my life. There was just a number of things that were challenging, and they were all coming at the same time, and they were all adding up. And I was just at that point where I was like, man, any sense of adrenaline with the pandemic is over and gone, right? If you subscribe to terminology like the COVID crash, like everybody experiences their COVID crash, mine came in the middle of the fall, and God brought me to the book of Haggai. Um, it wasn't part of a reading plan. It wasn't part of anything other than just a sense that this was going to be a significant text for me. And as I spent a couple of weeks in this text, in particular the passages that we're going to talk about today, I started to develop a sense that this was not just something that God wanted to use in my life, that he wanted to give me a couple of months to be able to get my mind around this and get my heart around it, but it's something that he really wants to use in the life of our church. And I'm sharing that because I want to make it safe to surface the difficulty that we are all up against as the result of a pandemic, as the result of economic uncertainty, as the result of snowstorms, as the result of um, political upheaval, you name it, uh, all the different things that we've pointed to throughout 
2020, uh, the reasons that we are all struggling with a sense of difficulty because um, that is one of the things that God does in this letter to Haggai, right? God is not the kind of person who comes into a situation of pain, who comes into a situation of difficulty or suffering or struggle and just kind of says, hey, you know, isn't this great though? Don't worry, guys. It's all going to be fine. It's all going to be happy. It's all going to be wonderful. You know, let's look on the bright side and let's just ignore the difficult realities of life. Right? Initially, what God does through the prophet Haggai almost seems a little mean, right? Because we looked at it last week that God has commissioned Israel uh, to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had come in and sacked Jerusalem. And Israel has come back and they've gotten started rebuilding that temple. And then Haggai chapter 2 comes about one month into that rebuilding process where God kind of calls time out and has a little conversation with Israel. And initially, it kind of feels like, whoa, I'm a little uncertain about this. I don't quite know where you're going here, God, because it gets off to a little bit of a rough start. Verse 3, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? Um, If you remember last week, I told you that Israel spent 50 years in exile in Babylon. So there were people, probably not a ton, but there were a number of people who had seen the original temple of Solomon when they were kids, when they were teenagers, when they were young adults, and then they went and they spent 50 years in Babylon, but now they're back. So there are literally some people in Israel that are now participating in the rebuilding of the temple that saw that original temple. And God says, hey, okay, so for those of you that experienced that original temple. Look around you now. You saw this house in its former glory. So how does it look to you now? And the answer is it's been decimated. It was crushed by Nebuchadnezzar, and then the temple has been neglected for 50 years. He's like, how how are we doing right now, guys? Doesn't it seem to you like nothing by comparison? And so I told you, it almost feels like God is being a little mean. It's like he's like rubbing Israel's face in it, but I I don't think that's what he's doing. I I think he's doing something far more gracious. I think he's doing something far more redemptive. I think he is giving Israel permission to acknowledge what was inherently obvious to them, that the temple was in a state of ruin, that the temple was in a state of of disrepair, that they were experiencing a tremendous amount of grief, that they were sad, that they were looking at it and thinking, man, I remember what this place was like. Man, this place was the center of the national and religious life for the entire nation of Israel. This place was so meaningful to me personally. This place was so beautiful. This place just architecturally communicated the glory of God. And look at it now. It's just a mess, and we're struggling to re-pour the foundation. Man, we've lost so much. Exile has cost us so much. God is wanting Israel to be able to surface that. And that was part of what I was experiencing this fall. Yeah, there was a bunch of hard stuff happening, and yes, all the adrenaline was gone, but there was just this sense in me of like, man, I just miss the way things used to be. I just miss what Sundays used to look like for us as a church. I miss seeing cars streaming in to a parking lot, and miss seeing people starting to already connect with each other outside, and then talking in the lobby. I really miss the fact that we used to have coffee in the lobby. I really miss the fact that we used to have kids running all over the place, and a bunch of people in blue t-shirts down the hall getting ready to serve, and RCC kids, and you know, seeing people that I care so much about come into the auditorium week after week after week, and just having that moment to be able to touch base and be like, oh man, how you doing? And, and what's the update? And how's life happening for you these days? And did you end up taking that trip? And just those quick catch-up moments that we almost took for granted, but right now feel so significant, right? I miss just being able to have our small group in our home, right? I miss being able to see people without a mask. I miss, you know, being able to just give people a hug or shake hands or anything but the awkward elbow chicken dance kind of thing that you sometimes feel obligated to do right now. I was like, man, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of over it. 
All right, and I'm not saying that to depress us all this morning, but you got to have that in mind. You got to be in that spot for verse four to carry its full weight. Look at what God says in the very next verse. He's like, I want you to acknowledge how much you've lost. And in light of that, verse four, even so, in spite of that, I'm aware of it. I'm looking at it. But even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong. Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. If you go back in the Hebrew, that verb, be strong, is a command. It's the strongest form of command in the Hebrew language. God's not just offering sentimentality from the side and like, buck up, guys. He's like, no, 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 no. I want you to be strong. I need you to be strong. We're trying to rebuild a temple. We are trying to show the world the glory of the God of Israel. (laughs) I'm going to need you guys to be strong in the midst of that. I think it's also helpful to note it's not just a command that God gives to his leaders. It's a command that God gives to all you people of the land. Those of you that are in leadership, whether that's at work or at home or in other organizations or leading in our church, you know that leadership is not easy, that it requires strength. And I think there's a reason that God sort of calls out Zerubbabel, who was the governor at the time, the political leader, and he calls out Joshua, who was the high priest, who was the religious leader. And he's like, no, no, I'm going to need you guys to be strong. But the game plan of God is not just that his leaders would be strong and the rest of us would live off of the wake of that. It's not just that God's going to single out a couple of people in our church and call them to strength and the rest of us are just going to be carried along by the momentum of that. He's like, no, no, no. I need all of you in the land to be strong. I mean, that, that's nice and that sounds inspiring, but the question is, what does that mean? Like, you know, be strong. It's a lovely hashtag, but what's he actually getting at? That word that he uses here, be strong, it can also be translated as live with a high degree of intensity. It's the same word that you find in Psalm 31, verse 24. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Live with a high degree of intensity. Live with a high degree of spiritual intensity. And I believe God is calling us as a community to recover a sense of spiritual intensity in our lives. And I have absolutely no doubt that's what he was doing in my life over the course of the fall. Where he's saying, hey, be strong. Be strong, be strong. Yeah, there's stuff coming at you. Yeah, you're tired. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but I need you to be strong. And I believe with all of my heart that that's what he wants to say to us as a church today. Restoration City, be strong. But here's the most important thing that you could hear me say today. God does not issue the command to be strong and then assume that his people are going to be able to get there on his own. Because right? that would just be brutally hard and so unfair to take a discouraged, frustrated people who are just coming back from exile, who are just getting their feet back under them and be like, all right, guys, I need you to just dial up the intensity a little bit. All right, you know, ready, set, go. Get Chris to sing the blessing. That'll help. But you're on your own. No, he doesn't do that. He's like, okay, I'm going to call you to a high degree of intensity. And then what he does from there is he says, I just want to encourage you with the promises of God that will fuel that sense of intensity in your life. This is just raw encouragement from God through Haggai to Israel, from God through Haggai to us today, where he just wants us to be anchored in the promises of God, the promises of God that apply in every one of our lives if we're a follower of Jesus and the promises of God that he is offering to you if you step into a relationship with him as an adopted son or an adopted daughter. All right, he promises his presence. For that one, you got to go all the way back to Haggai chapter 1. Right? That's why Pauline went back and started reading in verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, delivered the Lord's message to the people. And it starts with presence. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. 
the Lord roused the spirit of Zerubbabel. Other translations will say the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, the spirit of the high priest Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And he's stirring up everybody's heart right now. And then they began work on the house of the Lord of armies, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. This right here in three verses is the grace of the gospel right in the Old Testament. Right? You have got to see that God assures Israel that he is with them before they begin their work, not after. Right? That is so significant to our understanding of how God works. Because most of the time we assume that God operates with a plan where he kind of gives us something to do and then as we kind of get to work, as we start to make a little progress, as we show him that we're not going to mess it up totally, we start to prove ourselves a little bit. As we do that, then God starts to warm up to us a little bit where he's like, man, I like that kid. He's doing okay. Okay. He's going to turn out fine. It's safe for me to show him kindness. It's safe for me to show him grace. It's safe for me to show him mercy. And that's just not the God of the Bible. Right? The God of the Bible always makes the first move towards the broken. The God of the Bible always makes the first move to the hurting and to the confused. Before Israel picks up one brick, before they lay a foundation, before they do anything, he's like, hey, I just want you to know that I am with you. You don't have to earn that. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to do anything with it. And then he brings Israel back to it again in Haggai chapter 2. You're right, the pep talk. He's like, hey, don't forget, verse 5, this is the promise I made to you when you came out of Egypt, right? And my spirit is present among you. Don't be afraid. Right? That's so important for us to understand because it's the presence of God in our lives that drives out fear right? 1 John 4, 18, perfect love drives out fear. God himself is love. God himself is perfect love. God himself is redeeming love. God himself is sacrificial love. God himself is make the first move love. God himself is patient love. God himself is long-suffering love. God himself is personal love. God himself is Emmanuel, God with us kind of love. And it is the presence of that God in our lives that drives out all fear, which is so essential for us because all of us are in some battle with fear and anxiety right now. Right? Maybe fear about your job, maybe fear about the economic outlook, how's the company going to do, it's fear about something that's happening in your family, it's fear about something that's going on in your neighborhood, it's fear about something in your life that only you know about. And the antidote to that anxiety and the antidote to that fear. I'm not talking about anxiety with a medical cause. I'm talking about that sense of uncertainty, that sense of instability that we're all up against right now. The antidote to that is not more information, right? The antidote to that is more time in the presence of God, right? I'm all for information and knowing what's going on and what progress are we making getting people vaccinated and all that kind of stuff. But information itself is not going to take anxiety out of our hearts. The thing that will drive fear out of our hearts is just being saturated in the presence of God. Which is why the road to recovering our spiritual intensity runs straight through prayer and it runs straight through worship. Right? That's why what we are doing here together as a family this morning matters so much. Because we're drawing near to the God of heaven. We're celebrating the reality of his presence. We're inviting him to drive out fear. And the first thing that God would say to each one of us today who is already a follower of Jesus Christ is make no mistake about it, I am with you. I am for you. If you're here and you've yet to make that decision, that's still the first thing God would say to you. Right? God's first message is never clean your ways up, change yourself, fix yourself, make yourself more attractive to me. God's first message is always, I am with you. And that's where I sat for a couple of weeks this fall. It just became like a little refrain in my life. I am with you. My spirit is still among you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. 
My spirit is among you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. My spirit is among you. Don't be afraid. And I just had to sit there for a while. And I wonder if some of us don't need to sit in that same place for a while. And in case you think that's a promise that, you know, worked 2,500 years ago for Israel, but doesn't apply to us today, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, one of the most well-known texts in the New Testament, Jesus says to his followers, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, he knew we were going to be tempted to forget. He's like, hey, remember, you're all of that, remember, write this one down. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? And when God says he's with us, it's not just, you know, some sort of platitude that he throws at us from the comfort of heaven. Right? At Christmas, we celebrate the reality of Emmanuel, of God with us, of perfect peace and perfect glory who was willing to come and take on human flesh and to live among us and to dwell among us and to experience the temptations and to experience the trials and the pain and the suffering of humanity. So when God says he's with us, he knows what he's signing up for. And he doesn't mean it in a detached kind of way. He means it in a like, I'm with you kind of way. And by the way, he comes not just offering his presence, but he also comes offering his provision. Look at where the text goes next, verse 6 through 8. For the Lord of armies says this, Once more, in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of armies. The silver and gold, yeah, those belong to me. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. Again, how merciful, how compassionate. Because what God has called Israel to do is extraordinary. Right? They're supposed to rebuild a temple in the midst of a devastated city. But they're doing it on the heels of 50 years of exile. It's not like they went to Babylon to earn a bunch of cash and they're just coming back being like, all right, I got the money. Oh, hey, I happen to own a quarry. Oh, hey, I have a whole construction team that works for me. Man, all right, everybody, let's get together, whiteboard this sucker out. Okay, yeah, we can definitely rebuild the temple. Give us, you know, seven to eight months. We got this covered. This isn't going to be hard. No, they're coming back as a people who have been in exile. They've got nothing. And they're like, oh, you would like us to rebuild the temple. That's great. Very, very inspiring, God. Love the vision, man. Great. Just one question. How in the world do you see that happening? Because we've, we've checked, and we don't have the resources. We don't have what it takes. And God answers that question the same way he always does. Where he's like, oh, that, yeah, how's that going to happen? Yeah, I'm going to give you everything you need. That's how it's going to work, right? I know you want me to tell you how I'm going to give you everything you need. He's like, I'm sorry to tell you, that's not exactly how I work. I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to provide everything you need, and I'm going to ask you to trust that, and I'm going to ask you to move forward in faith, believing that I am going to actually do what I promise to do, right? Another way that you could say that in a uniquely distinct way is that there are no unfunded mandates in the kingdom of heaven, Right? God doesn't just decree things and then not give us the resources that we need to make it happen. That's not how God works. God promises to give us everything we need to do everything he's called us to do in life. Right? And, I, and I think that's really important for us to hold on to individually, and I think it's really important for us to hold on to as a church, to say, hey, we don't always know the answers in advance of how God is going to provide. In fact, I would argue that we rarely know in advance how God is going to provide. 
But we need to move forward with a sense of strength, with an intensity that's willing to believe that God is going to provide us everything we need as a church to do everything that he's called us to do as a church. And that's true of financial resources. That's true of a building to meet in. That's true of small group leaders. That's true of ministry team leaders. That's true of people willing to serve in ministry teams. That's true of people looking for a church home. It's true of people looking for hope. God is going to give us what we need to create a place that welcomes the city to come and hear the redemptive message of Jesus Christ. Right? But we just have to switch around our expectations. We have to switch around our thinking about it. Because when it comes to provision, we want a plan. And God relentlessly points us to a person. He's like, no, no, I, I know you want me to just give you the whole thing and drop it out and tell you that, hey, I've got this you know, leader that has just moved into the city and they're going to come in and they're going to have a huge role to play in shaping the future of kids ministry. And I've got this person who has a heart for generosity and they're going to be used in a significant way to fund a lot of what you're trying to do. And I, I mean, we all would feel better if we had the plan. And he's like, I know, I just, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Because right? a few minutes ago, I wanted you to see that God promised them presence before they ever started rebuilding the temple. But now, now you got to see that they had to start rebuilding the temple before God gave them the promise of provision. Right? That, that is equally important to see. He assures us of presence. He's like, okay, but I want you to get to work. I want you to start taking a couple of steps. And then as we start to follow, as we are in motion, God starts to provide for his work, right? That's what it means to walk by faith, right? That's what it means to take those first steps being like, I don't exactly know how this is going to happen and trust what he's going to provide along the way. Right? I had a moment a few minutes ago watching this team of people lead our church in song where I'm like, are you kidding me, God? Because I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we were sort of in a like, how are we going to get songs on the internet? Right? I, I, mean, that, I realize that sounds like, you know, so naive and so 2019 or maybe 2001. I, I don't know um, how you do the math, but that wasn't where we were as a church. We were not an internet broadcast church. We were more of a like Sunday in person kind of church. And it was like, oh my goodness, we are going to have to get music on the internet. Okay, how's that going to happen? Right? That's where we were. And then I see what God has done and what God is doing. And 10 months later, to be able to have such extraordinary moments of worship together. Look, that's the sacrificial generosity of a lot of people, and it's the provision of God. Right? Our, our challenge is to believe that he doesn't just do that with the people that lead from a stage, but he also does it with the people that lead in small groups, and he also does it with the people who serve on connect teams, and he also does it with people that serve on production teams, and he also does it with people that serve in kids ministry, and he does it as we have the courage to give voice to the gospel in our offices and in our apartment buildings and in our neighborhoods. He's going to give us everything we need. We just have to start walking first. Right? That's how this one works. Presence then provision, and then finally the promise of peace. Haggai 2.9. The final glory of this house will be greater than the first. Right? That one's worth thinking about. I spent a lot of time on that one this fall. Right? Just reminding myself and getting my heart in a place where I'm like, hey, our vision for 2021 is not to rebuild to where we were pre-pandemic. I'm not asking you to sacrifice and to get excited. I don't think it's spiritual intensity to be like, all right, guys, here's the plan. We're just trying to get back to a day where we can be in person without masks and some people watching kids. Okay, whew, let's band together and see if we can make that happen. Right? I, I think it is far more significant to say, no, what if we were to think and to dream and to imagine in a way that we believe that the final glory of the house would be greater than the first, or some translations will say the latter glory will be greater than the former. I will provide peace in this place. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies, right? We've talked about this before, but in the Bible, peace, particularly in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, peace is not just the absence of violence. It's the word shalom. It's the holistic well-being that comes through a relationship with the God of the people of Israel. 
It's this sense that, yes, the ultimate objective of everything is God's glory. The ultimate goal of the temple is to display the glory of God. The ultimate goal of the church is to display the glory of God. The ultimate goal of our lives is to show people the glory of God. But God's glory and our good are two sides of the same coin. Right, that as we live for the glory of God, he lives for the shalom of his people and he invites his people to live for the shalom of the world, for the holistic well-being, for peace. For as Paul would say, a peace that transcends human understanding. In other words, it's safe to leverage your life for the glory of God because the more that we leverage our lives for the glory of God, the more he commits himself to peace in our lives. The more God is saying, hey, you live for my glory, I'm going to watch out for you. You pursue my fame, I'll take care of you. You walk in obedience, I'll make sure you have everything you need. And I'll make sure that there is a peace that surpasses human understanding that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. All right, which brings me back to Haggai chapter 2, verse 4 again. Even so, be strong, Zerubbabel. This is the Lord's declaration. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. This is the Lord's declaration. Live in a state of spiritual intensity. But then, in fairness, there's another command. And it is a command in Hebrew. Work, for I am with you. That's the declaration of the Lord of armies. Right? So my goal for today is just to encourage us with the promises of God. But listen, the more that we understand that, the more we believe that, the more we will realize that our strength is sh- given life. Our strength becomes visible as we commit ourselves to serving Christ and to serving his interest in the world. Right? And I just want to open the door for that. Because I'll tell you where I think we are as a church. Right, I was super honest with you in December about where we are financially, and you responded with extraordinary generosity, and we got to give away $25,000 to other ministries in this city and around the world. So I'm just going to be super honest with you about where I think we are in terms of a culture of serving at our church. Right now, I think we're living at the intersection of momentum and exhaustion, if I'm honest with you. Um, God is doing some extraordinary things to our church. There are new people connecting with our church um, almost literally every single week, both in person and online. We are seeing new people get connected to small groups. There are some incredible things happening. But I will also tell you that it has been a really small group of people that have carried our church since about March or so. That's not guilt. That's not anything. That's just reality of like, hey, there's been a crew that said, look, we're going to make sure Sundays happen. We're going to make sure Connect Team happen. We're going to make sure some stuff happens. And I think it is safe to say on their behalf that they are getting a little tired and that a couple of innings of really solid relief pitching, if I can use a sports analogy, that's my one for the year, um, but a couple of innings of relief pitching would be really helpful. Just a couple of new faces in the Connect team would be really helpful. A couple of extra people on the production team would be really helpful. A couple of people that are willing to help us start putting together sort of a very limited skeleton version of Restoration City Kids would be helpful. I'll, I'll be honest, we're not even at the moment of like, all right, we need the whole church to rally around this one. We need a couple of people, though. We need a couple of people who are willing to say, okay, I can jump in and I can help. Right? So be strong and let's get to work, right? Well, let's get to work. Don't lose sight of that. But man, don't let that take your eye off of be strong and just rest in the promises of God. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just want to ask you for your grace in our life as a church. God, I want to thank you for your promises. God, I want to thank you that everything that Haggai spoke to the people of Jerusalem 2,500 years ago, that it all applies to us. Your presence, your provision, your peace. It's all on the table for us right now. I just want to thank you for that, God. Lord, you tell us in the scripture that you stirred up the hearts of the people. Would you do that today in our church? Would you stir up our hearts? 
on this snowy Sunday, would you just stir up our hearts with affection for you, with love for each other, with a belief that you are with us, that your spirit is among us, that there's no reason to be afraid. God, would you start to show us what it might look like for us to do our part, not in rebuilding Solomon's temple, but in helping this expression of the local church roar back to life. Would you show us what you're asking us to do to communicate the hope of Jesus to this city? God, would you lead us? Would you guide us? And we pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.